Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending uh, Shaw Selby's talk, Wild Hardware Adventures with Ecological IoT and National Geographic. Shaw is an engineer and conservation technologist who works to identify and deploy technologies that can help with our greatest conservation challenges. His projects have integrated crowdsourcing, smartphone apps, drones, satellite data, and sensors to address conservation issues, including illegal poaching and the monitoring of protected areas. He founded Conservify, the first solely conservation technology makerspace and prototyping lab here in Los Angeles. And that's the lab that you were telling me about, right? Yeah, cool. Shah has spent the last five years on expeditions in Angola and Botswana, and in the, pro and in the process, he and his team have developed FieldKit, a joint hardware software platform and architecture that fuses the best of open science and open storytelling. He's going to talk about big data, uh, or about how big data and IoT form the foundation for live data expeditions and how it's helping protect one of the last untouched places on Earth. I'm looking forward to hearing his stories that included field work in places like, uh, I should have asked you how to pronounce this. Okavango. What he said. Uh, Banff National Park and the Peruvian Amazon and apparently there's a story about a tweet from space as well. Cool. So uh, welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Shaw Selby. Sorry. Sorry, one last announcement. Uh, when your talk is done, uh, the uh, badge hacking award ceremony and the closing remarks will be over in uh, the music school stage. So uh, in case everybody just sort of stands up and walks out, I want to make sure everybody knows what's the deal after the talk. All right. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for coming by. It's, it's always tough being the last talk and opposite the uh, build your own iPhone guy. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, I'm an engineer by training. I worked actually for 10 years um, on satellites. I worked in satellite propulsion systems. Um, that's one of, well, the, ro the satellite I worked on is at the top of that rocket. Um, that, that rocket itself uh, didn't have the best, you know, so I've, I put tw 12 satellites up in space. Um, the, the, one of the satellites I put up in space, this is what happened to it. 10, Digit. 9, Digit. 8, 7, 6, 6 5, 4, Maybe three, you should start coming two, out. 1, go inertial. <laughs> See, it, it, it went the opposite way it's actually supposed to go. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a company that's not around any longer because of... Uh, because of what you can guess. So, um, so yeah, so that, you know, I used to work in aerospace. I had a traditional office in a cubicle. Um, this is what my office looks like now uh, for a lot of the year. Um, this, this is us on expedition in, um, in Botswana, and this is what happens when uh, you're on a river expedition in canoes and the water gets too low for the, for the river um, to, uh, to allow us to go anymore. You have to strap on harnesses and pull boats like your oxen. Um, and then these are the coworkers that you end up uh, working alongside. That's a Nile crocodile. Um, I just stuck my GoPro in the water and it swam right underneath us. So we're surrounded by those things all the time. And, and this is the work uh, environment that you, uh, that you have to work in. So we're standing in water. I, you know, in 2015, I was in water much like this, um, uh, building stuff, and I pulled my legs out and I had nine leeches um, on my legs at once. So that, that was the expedition record for that year was nine at once. Um, so, and then, you know, to, to do that kind of work, we have to, uh, this is how we travel with a, a lot of stuff and very big, um, large baggage fees all the time. So, um, so what I do now is I'm a conservation technologist. Uh, I'm, I'm a explorer with the National Geographic Society and, and a fellow there where I'm working on, on this intersection of technology and wildlife and environmental conservation and helping them think through uh, what that looks like. Um, so I, you know, I don't have to talk to all you guys about where we are in terms of technology and the, and the amazing growth we've had in recent times. Um, you know, th this picture, I, I always like showing this picture because, you know, everything this guy's holding and it's in front of him, um, we, ha we have on a little computer in our pockets. Um, but while we've been going through this amazing, like, technological growth, we've also been going through um, one of the worst environmental uh, times in human history. So uh, we're in the middle of what's what a lot of people consider the sixth mass extinction. So there's been big extinction events in the past, you know, with, with the Ice Age or with dinosaurs. And um, this is the first time that it's actually just been caused by a single species, and that species is us. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a very uh, rough time in terms of, of wildlife uh, conservation in the environment. 
And you know, my work looks at, at uh, bringing those two things together to try and solve, solve that problem. So as was said before, I, I have a lab, um, uh, and Jacob's here as well, he works in the lab as well, and, and we build all the gear that we take on expedition and, and put out in the world in this lab. Um, it's, uh, it's right in the middle of where you would think when you think of wildlife conservation, which is downtown Los Angeles. Um, but we have like all sorts of uh, prototyping materials and right before we go to the expedition, this thing gets pretty uh, messy and wild looking um, as we're getting through it. So uh, we have a bunch of different projects and, and I'll, I'll very quickly go through some of the ones that we've done through in the past. We, uh, you know, we've worked on drone stuff, uh, drones for um, lots of different reasons, uh, ocean, con or, you know, ocean conservation, finding illegal fishing, um, saving rhinos, things like that is, is stuff that we've worked on in the past. Um, Tracking animals to better understand where animals are going and and um, and make sure they're going into places that they're going to be safe and not in the in the line of poachers and stuff. So uh, we 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 have two projects that are starting there where we're tracking uh, sharks in Belize in the in the Mesoamerican reef system, the barrier reef system they have there, and another one that's that's just getting started where we're going to track whales in um, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area in, in Antarctica. Um, and then uh, another project that we have is, is one called Undersea Connection. Has anyone here ever heard of Rainforest Connection? So uh, it was a Kickstarter project uh, a while back, but it's run by a friend of mine, and, and they take old cell phones that people donate, and they write software on the cell phones, and they put them up in the rainforest, and they listen for illegal logging that's happening there um, using the cell phone. It's, it's a pretty neat project, and, and they've done some really cool stuff. Well, we got a grant to collaborate with them and, and take that technology, um, attach it to hydrophones, and put it on buoys uh, in the ocean. So we, ha we have a, a test buoy in the port of LA, and, and we're looking to kind of uh, scale that out and, and, and use it for marine protected area. It turns out you can, uh, from the acoustic signature underwater, you can tell, like, you know, obviously you can tell if a vessel passes by, but you can even tell the type of fishing that a vessel is doing or the size of the vessel just from the, the acoustic signature, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but the main project I'm going to talk to you about tonight is, is uh, one that's called the Okavango Wilderness Project. So this is something that started in 2014, and we had been going back um, until uh, this year on, on multiple expeditions to really understand uh, what's happening in this really amazing place called the Okavango Wilderness, uh, the, called the Okavango Delta. And uh, these are all the people who are on the 2016 Okavango Delta crossing. Um, the Okavango Delta is, if you haven't heard of it, it's this really beautiful, amazing place in northern Botswana. It's a, um, it's a delta that, that is in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. And so it's actually one of like the most pristine environments um, that you can, you can find um, in sub-Saharan Africa for when it comes to the wildlife, the, the animals there. It's uh, home to the largest population of African elephants, and it has all that big charismatic megafauna that we all think about when we think about sub-Saharan Africa, you know, lions, hippos, all that stuff. It's, re it's a really amazing uh, place. And the um, <clears throat> the threats that are to the, the development in Angola sorry. since the, uh, the the threats that um, that are in in um, the Okavango Delta come from upstream. So all the water that goes into the delta flows from Angola through Namibia and then feeds into this massive delta. Um, now Angola, uh, you know was this country that went through a really rough civil war uh, for, for 26 years and then came out of it, and now they're the, the biggest oil producer in Africa. Um, and so there's a lot of, of, of demand for that water that's flowing through, and what, the, what the, the job of the Okavango Wilderness Project was was to show the importance of protecting that area and, and the areas upstream um, as a result of that. And, and, and since it is a delta and all the animals there rely on the water that's in the delta, that water is the thing that we have to protect the most. And so what we came in as engineers was, you know, how can we understand what the baseline level of the water is there and how can we track it like in a very finite way if things were to change? Um, and so we did that using sensors. Um, so we built these sensor systems over the last couple of years. We started using you know, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and all that kind of stuff, and went on to like breadboards and, and protoboards and all that, and um, we, we have another mill in the lab, so we're milling circuits as a result of that, and then you know, Osh Park, um, we used to, to order a lot of the, the boards that went in from there. And so, and, and, and we even went the full gamut of, of um, of kind of mesh technology, you know, the networking technologies as well, and, and how the external communications were. So, you know, we've used Zigbee, and we're now on LoRa stuff, and 
we've uh, sent back data using cellular, satellite, Wi-Fi, whatever you can kind of think of, and we just kind of ex um, explored along the way. But one of the things we wanted to do was all that data that we collected while we were on expedition, um, we wanted to share it with the world live, like as we were out there on expedition. So, you know, our, our team built this website called intotheokavango.org that if you went on it while we were on expedition, you would see what we were seeing. Um, pictures, you would see the water quality, you'd see, you'd see the wildlife sightings, everything that we were seeing as we were going. And I'm, you know, one of those bubbles that say S, that's, that's actually me on expedition in 2016. Um, and so we, we wanted to change the paradigm about how expeditions were run. So scientists would go to these really amazing places, they'd see this really amazing stuff, um, and then they'd come back and you know, all that data would sit on a, hardware for, on a hard drive for like two years while they're publishing papers, and no one would ever kind of hear about the stuff that they were doing. So we said, we're gonna change that paradigm totally and we're just gonna share it with the world immediately, all open data, everything's open source. Um, so we built the tool to let us do that. And along the way, we also, uh, you know, we carried along cameras. Everything was like correlated by GPS and time, 360 degree cameras so you can like follow along on the expedi expedition as we go. And, um, and you could see um, all that stuff was available through the website. So, you know, these are wildlife sightings that we're, ha we're seeing. There are di different species of plants and animals right there. And the pictures that are associated with each one of these little um, orbs are 360 degree photos that we took along the way, but we also had like habitat shots and, and things like that. And so the really uh, amazing thing when you bring all that data together was the fact that like now we know where the wildlife is, what the water quality is around, uh, or temperature, humidity, all that stuff. We know what it looks like, what the habitat, you know, type of habitat is, and you could really start to get some interesting insights when you put all that data together. Um, but since we were doing an, uh, you know, an open data and, and a live project, we w really wanted to kind of leverage social media too. So we got all these social media accounts and we, we were like sharing everything, kind of aggressively sharing everything as we're going through um, the expedition. And so one, one example of that was you know, in, in 2015, when the team was in um, Angola, it, they were in a really difficult part of Angola, that, a place that hadn't been scientifically explored in you know, probably 60 years, maybe even more. Um, and so the, the river that they were traveling down had actually kind of collapsed. It was very narrow and windy and the water flowed fast so the boats were tipping over all the time and there's bees everywhere. It's just like a really not fun environment to, to be in. And in the spirit of sharing everything on, online, we, we complained about it on Twitter. Um, and one of our followers actually saw that complaint and, and tweeted us back this message of support. And um, that person was Samantha Cristoforetti, who is a European, European Space Agency astronaut that was on the International Space Station and following our expedition from space. And she took that picture and tweeted it back down to us. So that was like pretty incredible. Like that, that was a morale booster and it's the first time we got a tweet from someone not on this planet. Um, but the data we collected is actually like really useful to the scientists that we were, we were working with because they got to visualize it and see it in ways that they would have never really thought about it before. Um, since we were doing everything tied to time and GPS, um, it, was, it was really kind of this like very finite look at what that environment was at that point in time. And you start to see where like the certain biodiversity areas were that were particularly important. And when we were in these unexplored area, sci unexplored scientifically areas in Angola, that's also what led into us understanding what areas needed to be protected, where they need to put protected areas or Ramsar sites or other things that, that, um, that, that need to, to be there to protect these animals. Um, and we also, uh, we put out a lot of sensors, right? So we built sensor networks in Botswana, Namibia, and, um, and Angola, <clears throat> all to try and gather what the water quality was changing over that time and, and how the flood dynamics were changing. Um, to get a better idea of, of, of what that environment looks like. This is a picture from a, a sensor that we had um, at one of the source lakes in Angola um, because we wanted just to see like how the water changed as, as it was at this very pure part of Angola and it, as it came down into, um, into Botswana. So, um, so we had such like a, a, a great outpouring of, of excitement from other scientists and educators and you know, STEM folks and all these people about the way that we did this ex expedition, um, that we decided we wanted to take all the tools that we developed and turn it into a, a free and open source 
project that anybody can actually use. And so uh, what we're building is what we call FieldKit. It's at um, fieldkit.org. Um, and, and this is the team of, of the people who have been working on FieldKit up to this point, um, doing both hardware and software development. So, uh, so basically what it is, it's this one-click platform that field researchers can use, but also just you know, interested folks, explorers, students, and, and communities. Um, and so the idea that we wanted is we, we, we didn't want uh, it to have these advanced tech skills. The stuff that we built is probably stuff that a lot of you guys could build in the field. But it's not stuff that maybe uh, you know, a, a biologist in some different part of the world um, would be able to build, or, or it would take them way too long, or it would cost them too much money, right? We, we looked at the way that field scientists were doing stuff out there, and they were either buying these very expensive, old, legacy, proprietary systems, or they were trying to solve all these things by themselves and making the same mistakes that we made in 2014 and 2015 and 2016, right? And so we wanted to create a baseline that allowed people to do that moving forward. And that includes hardware, it includes an app that lets you kind of interface with things, and a visualization platform. Um, this is just some of the stuff that we have on the software side of things uh, for FieldKit, and that allows us to do this page where we have these visualizations, and, and um, it looks a lot like that into the Okavango uh, website that I showed you guys before, but it, you know, we have an API page and a map page, and, um, and you could really kind of leverage that. And, and the FieldKit it's at it, as itself, it treats everything like, they, we call them documents, so it doesn't care if it's a sensor reading or if it's a form from your app or anything like that, but it kind of just, collects it all and, and puts it in a way that um, is easily, easily um, identifiable. And, and you could define what those in, inputs are and outputs are. And that includes social media stuff if you want to do that. And it all gets mapped um, using GeoJSON. And then on top of it, we wanted to create like these, um, these hardware tools that allowed people to do things easier. So we built, we built this, um, these boards that we've been kind of moving forward on. Um, this is one of our core boards here. And we, we've been trying out all these different types of sensors on the board and, and trying to document what that would all look like um, if people wanted to repeat that. So one of those projects was um, something that we've been working with uh, uh, folks that um, we're, it's, it's gonna happen next year with iNaturalist. So have you guys heard of iNaturalist? This is pretty cool. Um, pretty cool app that you can download. So basically, the idea is, you know, you you download this app, you take a picture of like a plant or an animal that you see, and then there's a whole bunch of like uh, biologists that will classify what that plant or animal is. So it's a way of crowdsourcing a biodiversity uh, survey, basically. So now, so they've there's become this big like educational push behind using iNaturalist, and they do these things called BioBlitz, where they where they send out a bunch of students in like a park, and they'll do a big biodiversity sub survey on iNaturalist. Um, but one thing that they never had was like this kind of baseline environmental metadata about like what, you know, where these observations were happening. So we, we designed a board that would allow the kids to, to, to gather all that data as they're going out in the field, or even the scientists that actually use um, iNaturalist as a tool. Um, and part of FieldKit is also documenting this, the sensor stuff that we use. So we're, uh, Part of it is this open source sensor library that we're building that kind of goes through a lot of like the details behind like why you'd use that kind of sensor um, calibration information, all, all, all the stuff that, um, that would happen with that. And so one example of like one of the, the sensors that, that uh, a person that we've been working with was exploring was, was this one. So, so this tool is, is called a Gurley Price Meter. Um, it's a flow meter and it's actually, you know, the, it was invented in 1880, it's really old. Um, but it's super expensive. So if you want to buy a brand new one of these, it's it's like $3,500 to buy a brand new meter. So we're like, okay, well, what if we want people to, to be able to take flow measurements and streams, but they don't have $3,500 to do it? And, and just as a thought exercise, we figured like, what if, could we 3D print one? Could we create one that like anybody could build themselves? And so we tried that and we uh, tested it out in the field and it actually worked, um, which is pretty awesome. And, and all of that, that stuff is open source. And sure, like maybe it's not gonna last 150 years like some of the original Gurley Price meters, um, but, but do you need that? Do, do, uh, do the scientists out there need that? Not necessarily, so. Um, another project that we, we worked on that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about is, is in Banff um, National Park. So uh, we, we were working to monitor how glaciers are changing over time. And, and this is a glaciologist that we work with at the University of Alberta um, named Jeff Cavanaugh. Um, so, you know, the, the glaciers, that, that we have in a lot of parts of this world are, are melting fast, they're changing fast. And, and, um, and a, a way of monitoring these, these changes is, is through, um, through ice quakes. And so basically as the glaciers melt, they're melting at the, at the ice uh, rocks 
um, surface right there. And, a, and as they're changing over time, they'll, the, the glacier will move and you'll get this ice quake. So a big measurement that a lot of like these glaciologists do is to try and understand it. And they, they had these big old proprietary systems. We said, okay, maybe we could take this like field good approach and we can measure the movement of this glacier over time. And so what we did was we created these tools that, that would measure um, using accelerometers and geophones. Geophones are kind of like a, um, like microphones for the earth, basically. And, it, and what it's monitoring is like, is, is those ice quakes, how often those ice quakes happen and where, how they move in 3D space. Um, so we built this system. Uh, it, the system is a lot bigger and takes a lot more power than you would expect because the, one of the outputs of the system is a project that we're not really allowed to talk about yet, but it's bringing back that data like live, super high fidelity, and it's, and it's going to become um, the centerpiece of a, of a really large public art installation. So, so the, in the middle of a major city, very close to Banff, uh, they're gonna have this big public art installation that's, that's taking live glacier data and turning it into sounds and lights and, and, like, um, and everything. So you could see how that's changing over time. And we, and we saw some very strange behavior. I mean, this thing is moving pretty aggressively and it's moving a lot. Um, we even saw there was parts of, of, on the glacier, there was these rock outcroppings that, you know, when we went back a few months later, you, you could see so much more of the rock just because it's melting so fast. And this is, a, this is the Bow Glacier, um, uh, which is a major glacier in that area, and it feeds the Bow River, which cuts right through Banff National Park and goes, um, goes down into to different parts of Canada. Um, and then we got to, you know, after we built it, we got to celebrate a little bit. This right here, the glaciologist, uh, we were walking across the glacier, and he, and he pointed out this certain bit of ice and said, oh, you know what, this, this is 80,000-year-old ice. Um, he just knew that. Uh, I don't know how he knew that, but but what we did was we we broke it off and we brought it back to the cabin we were staying at, and we drank bourbon over 80,000 year old ice, which is pretty cool. Um, and the last project that I'm going to talk about is um, is uh, this Boiling River project. So uh, this this is Andreas Russo. He's um, he's a geothermal scientist. And he grew up in an area where he heard these, these kind of legends about this, this uh, mythical river in the Peruvian Amazon um, that was boiling. But like people didn't really know where it was. Um, there, there were communities that lived there, but they were kind of disjointed. And he went on this quest to find this, this um, boiling river in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and he did find it. And so he's been studying it over the last couple of years and trying to really understand why uh, why it's so interesting from a, ge from a um, geothermal standpoint. And the reason why is, you know, Peru doesn't have volcanoes. So this river isn't like a lot of these other rivers that are boiling in, in different parts of the world that they're driven by volcanoes. The water that's, that comes up into this boiling river is actually just very deep, old water that comes up very quickly and, and ends up becoming part of a boiling, this, this, this river. That's not boiling upstream of the river, it's just this one segment of it's boiling. So he came to us and he, he wanted to understand the water quality in different parts of this river and because some of it was actually pretty hard and inaccessible to get to. So we built this probe for him and Jacob uh, went, went down to the Amazon and deployed the probe in these different parts of the river. So, you know, this, this probe is gathering um, all sorts of different water chemistry data as it's traveling down this boiling river. You can see the steam rising off of it. And there was all sorts of, like, struggles that we ran into. We, um, the, the probe is... The top part of the probe is filled with buoy foam um, that is, I don't know if you've ever worked with buoy foam, but it's, it's uh, really a pain. We actually were filling up one of the, uh, another buoy earlier, and I, and I got the measurements wrong, and it actually exploded in the lab. So we, for the longest time, we had like random bits of buoy foam like all over the lab. Um, but, um, but we ran into like all sorts of different problems, and so that's kind of what happens in, in this line of work. This is Andreas uh, climbing down a, a fairly treacherous area. Remember, the water underneath him is boiling. It's it's a hundred degrees Celsius. It, that's you know, if he falls in, he's not going to uh, be feeling very very good after that. Um, so this is them oh, trying wow. to get it there. unstuck from an area. Go little, go little drone probe. My little pet. <laughs> that's Jacob. Just <laughs> what it's doing? Stop! Don't you dare <laughs> These fucking currents, man. <laughs> Careful. Oh, there's a bunch oh, of right here. I think we just gotta wait for it. I think it'll, if it get it that way, the current will take it eventually. Very, also, we can throw rocks at it. <laughs>
Yeah, sometimes you have to throw rocks at the things that you build out there. I, we, that's the one cool thing about the work that we do is like you never really know what to anticipate. Like, you know, we're in the lab in LA designing a float that's going to go in a boiling river in a Peruvian Amazon, which we hadn't ever been to before. You know, we didn't know what what it was going to look like, and so that's kind of what informs a lot of our design. And then and then you run into weird things like this in the field. You know, in 2015, I I built a wa uh, water sensor that was deployed in Namibia, and and deployed it and. It stopped working, went back the following day, and it was because a hyena actually chewed on it. And the reason we knew that was because there was a trail camera that saw the hyena walk towards the water sensor, saw an LED light on it, and was like, oh, what's that? And starts chewing on it. So we learned, you know, hyenas like LED lights. So that shouldn't be on the stuff that you put in hyena country. Um, so yeah, so we have a lot of uh, work like that. I talked about the top three that we're doing. We're deploying some field kit um, sensors and, and kind of base stations throughout the Congo Basin um, in a project that we have with UCLA. Um, I, I talked about those two other ones, animal tracking, and then we're probably gonna do something similar to what we did in the Boiling River in, in Sri Lanka with a, with a really amazing um, scientist there. She's, she's um, trying to engage a lot of the, the people in that area um, with, a, with a big educational push, which is pretty great. Um, and we have a NOAA grant where we're working on a CTD device, which is a basic oceanographic measurement. It's a conductivity, temperature, depth. So we, we're creating a low-cost CTD sensor for uh, citizen science purposes. Um, so, you know, over the next year, we're going to be deploying FieldKit and, and, and releasing it to the world. So if, if you go to fieldkit.org, you can sign up if you want to help. I mean, we need all the help we can get on, on, on creating some of this. So, um, so we'd be happy to collaborate and give you... Um, give you stuff uh, based on whatever we do. But you know, I'll, I'll, the, the exciting thing in general is that when I first started this work, the conservation community didn't really think about technology. Um, they, they would buy really expensive proprietary systems for one little thing, but they didn't realize like, how much of a use it is. And the last like, five years, it's really changed. So now like, a lot of these organizations are actually very excited about technology, and all those big buzzwords that, that you hear people talk about, like the news and the tech press and stuff like that, there's people who are thinking about applications of that in the conservation world. And, and, and organizations like WWF are hiring engineers. There's lots of really exciting stuff to, that's happening right now. And one really great way to get involved if you're interested, one is like things like crowdsourcing. So tools like, um, tools like iNaturalist, like I mentioned before, that allows you to kind of uh, get out there and start collecting data. FieldKit as well is gonna uh, allow for crowdsourcing. There's a, an organization that, that we work with um, called Conservation X Labs. Um, they're creating this digital makerspace. So that, that link up at the top is, is um, something you could go to if you actually want to, to help out with some of these conservation projects. Like these, these uh, organizations and, and, and scientists will, will post on this board saying, hey, we need um, some software engineer to help us with X, Y, and Z. And, and you can become integrated with that team and actually help them do it. And not all of these are nonprofits. Some of them are, are actually for profits that might become companies and things like that. Um, and we're also just launching, so I, I came up with this idea to, to do a technology prize around uh, marine protection. So uh, marine protected areas, when we set up these reserves in these parks in the oceans, like how do, you, um, how do you protect that using technology? There's a lot of really cool things that you could do. So um, I pitched it to National Geographic a couple years ago and they, they finally got around to doing it. Um, and they just, uh, they're gonna be launching it in the next couple of uh, weeks. So if you go to that website up there, you. And, you know, you could you could form a team and, and try and win. I think they're giving something around uh, five hundred thousand dollars out for a cool idea. So, um, if you have a cool idea and you want to try and um, try and help the world, there's a, there's a lot of options out there. So um, so yep, that's everything that I had. We can I could take questions or whatever. But thank you. Uh, I, I think that they do. Uh, I don't know exactly how, how they do that, but I know, um, I, th I think they're starting to try and figure that out. I think sometimes people take, take pictures of things. They don't actually use the app, like the, f the phone, on the camera on the smartphone to take the picture, so they'll upload it later on and stuff, but. Yeah. 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 
Um, so the uh, Conservation X Labs, uh, the, the guy who formed that was the previous chief scientist for USAID. So um, I, I know a lot of the folks there. We haven't done any specific projects. The NOAA project is actually a collaboration with this uh, engineering firm um, that we work with on some other stuff, and it's an SBIR project. So, um, so the, the, other, the engineering firm got an SBIR, SBIR grant. Since our lab's a nonprofit, we can't get SBIR funding, but we could be a subcontractor under, underneath that. Uh, Swift Engineering, San Diego. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Oh, yeah. So with the field trip, uh, like, so you have the cell phone and that module, how do they communicate? Yeah, so uh, the module has a Wi-Fi chip on it. Yeah, so it so sets up an access have point. Have you any of those? And the phone would aggregate the data from them? Ye do you want to? Yeah, you can also just pull the data onto the app and, and upload it to, to your field kit instance, so, yeah. So when you're out in the field, is there connectivity? In, in some places there is. We, uh, in, in a lot of the places we go, it's like very, very remote places. Uh, and so we, we usually use Iridium to, to get the data back, or at least like some kind of understanding of, of state of health and, and, and random data. And then that higher fidelity data is saved on the device itself, and then we'll go back and pull it later on um, is, is how, we, how we do it. In the continuous uh, rainfall? Yeah. You said they were using old cell phones? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like they had the service thing? Yeah, so, so the way he usually does it is he sets up his own kind of ad hoc network, cellular network, and then pulls the data back through one point, and usually like long distance kind of links where he pulls it. Oh, like yeah, he sets up like a small like cell network and, oh. and pulls the data back that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he does it. Yeah, he's like in Bolivia and, and stuff. Yeah, he's out in the middle of the rainforest, so. Cool, all right, thank you very much.